good evening. Hi. Hi. I'm Steve. Uh, and thanks for, I'm going to have to put a timer on this because if I don't put a timer on it. You're fine. We, we, we're only no, no, I, I can always tell, right? People check out, eyes glaze over in the back of their head. Um, I get it. I mean, I have an 18 year old daughter. Like, I get it. So, I see that look daily. Um, so, anyway, here's what I thought I'd do today. Um, actually, I don't think this works, so I'm going to have to drive here. So what I thought I'd talk to you about today is what we're going to cover, right? So what I was going to cover with you guys today, I'll tell you a little bit about my background, talk to you a little bit about what we do at Collective Eye, no sales pitch, but I think you need to understand that because that influences our philosophy and how we work as an organization. And what I like to start off with, and I encourage everyone to start off with, is what is the problem you solve? If you focus on the problem you solve versus the products that you sell, the problem you solve and the people you solve those problems for, you're going to be in a much better place. So I always like to start everything off before I tell you about our company. I'll talk to you about the problems we solve. So we'll talk about that uh, and who we solve them for. We'll talk a little bit about why it matters. And then we'll talk to you a little bit about the tools, the team, and, and the tactics. Does that sound like a good use of our time? Sure. Awesome. So, so hey, thanks for the intro, Charlie. So who's this dude? Who's Steve? So I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about my background. Um, so I've started like a long time ago. Like I, I started selling in the eighties and amazingly, like we actually did that with no cell phones and like, and like, it was amazing that things got done. I look back on those days and I'm like, that was ridiculous. What was going on then? Just like we look back on marketing today and think about how ridiculous marketing might've been 15 years ago before it got digitized. Right, because if you think about, and I know some of you in the audience are in in in, um, in uh, B two C consumer marketing, that is very targeted. I don't even think you should be seeing advertising anymore. I think you should be seeing very relevant one to one messages, marketing messages, and, and the data and the use of that data allows you to do that. But in the sales world, we're still in this hand to hand combat, like you know, battle it out. Rep makes call, rep interprets what's going on. So um, I was doing that back in the 80s. So I started at Pepsi, like many young people. I was a 22 year old right out of school. I started working for Pepsi Cola. I, I transferred those skills over to FedEx, worked my way up through the ranks at FedEx. I was the managing director of sales here for the Northeast for FedEx, had about 300 reps, but a billion dollar quota. And I decided I'd take an entrepreneurial leap and I partnered with Stephen and Heidi Messer, who you may or may not know, some New York-based entrepreneurs. We started a little company called LinkShare, and we sold that to Rakuten back in 2005 for about 430 million bucks. So it was a great exit. Um, I could tell you all kinds of stories about how we almost missed payroll and almost went out of business, and we were very lucky. Um, I then went and started a company called GSI Media, which was part of GSI, if you're familiar with that, and we sold that business to eBay back in 2011. And I spent the last uh, six years running the ad tech stack at eBay. And for those of you who keep up with eBay, um, they decided to sell PayPal. They wanted to sell eBay Enterprise, which was my company. And we just unpacked that. So um, in February, I think why it's really relevant to talk about, in February, I joined my partners from LinkShare, Stephen and Heidi Messer, and Tad Martin, who was the COO of at Overstock, to get involved in the company they had started up called Collectivot. And we'll talk to you a little bit about that. So I've actually spent the last two months of my life standing up that sales organization. So we'll talk to you a little about how we did that. So I've been doing this about 28 years. I've seen about a thousand reps, done about $3.4 billion of enterprise value and done three exits. Does it make me qualified to talk to you today? I don't know, but I do have 11 minutes and 32 seconds left. So what's the problem, right? <laughs> and you're here, right? And I got like six more slides. So. So what is the problem, right? What's the problem, right? And in this B2B world, you know, we manage revenue through seller activities. And think about your CRMs, right? Like Salesforce.com is a wonderful company and I'm not here to bash Salesforce.com, but I've never seen a $50 billion market valuation company where I can't find anybody who loves it, <laughs> right? It's a wonderful container of information, of information that you put in, but what does it help you do? And what I would submit to you is like, despite all the money we spend in sales automation and all the money that we send to spend to get things done, the numbers in B2B sales are horrendous. I mean, they are horrendous. And I, I don't make these up. And for those of you who are, who are thinking about sales and setting up sales teams, I encourage you to subscribe to CSO um, Magazine, subscribe to that. That's a wonderful resource to get wonderful stats. Uh, Accenture has a wonderful uh, sales uh, deck out right now. And, and tons of great stuff. So this is the source of this. 
So think about this. When a rep commits to a deal closing, they get it right 46% of the time. 40s. I'm not talking about your pipeline. I'm just talking about like you show up at your forecast Friday meeting and say, hey man, I'm closing this deal. You get that right 46% of the time. Now I can flip a coin and have better odds than that. Right? I go to Vegas and get better odds than that. But I'm spending trillions of dollars in Salesforce automation to yield out 46% accuracy. 75% of sales managers' time, if you look at any attitude survey, it's all, I could spend more time, with too much time in admin. 56% of reps miss quota. 25% of the sales professionals in this country are going to get turned over this year. They're going to get fired or they're going to quit. That means you're turning your sales force over every four years. And when you talk about the cost of sales turnover, and you say, hey, it's the cost of a rep's pipeline for a year, 90% of the time, that's because all the intellectual capital around that pipeline just walked out the door. Why? Because they don't put that data in Salesforce. Like, why are we asking sales reps to do data entry? Why are we asking sales reps to do the job that most of the other departments have outsourced? Right? Data entry gets outsourced. Why are we asking salespeople, the people who are responsible for the oxygen of the company, why are we asking them to do data entry? Selling's done through playbooks, it's not done through personalization. And from top of the funnel till close, the statistics tell you you close 2% of everything you touch. We all agree, Any, uh, bad numbers, right? Yes, no? All right, that's good. Because if you don't buy into the problem, then the solution doesn't mean anything to you, right? <laughs> that's a huge problem. And here's why it matters. We spend a ton of money as our organizations trying to fix that. Right, 13,000 B2B enterprises have sales forces of more than 50 people. I'm not gonna read all these stats to you. Tons of money, $8 trillion. Companies spend a trillion dollars in, in the United States to generate $8 trillion of revenue. I mean, there's a huge amount of costs associated with solving this problem, but it's just not getting any better. It's not getting any better. In fact, last year, for the very first time in the last decade, more reps missed quota than ever before, and the average quota went down. The average quota for reps went down last year. So it's not getting any better. And, and, and what I would tell you, it's not because there isn't a lot of effort against it. I would tell you the front end of the stack, lead gen, lead qual, there's a lot of great companies there doing great work, right? You think about those companies and the marketing automation, great work. And on the back end of the stack, when someone's a customer, I think there's a lot of great work. Right, you got NPS scores, you got companies like Tatango, you got companies like Gainsight, right? You got wonderful work going on there. You got the voice of the customer and you got the voice of the prospect. But when something's in that sales cycle, where's that voice of the buyer? And I would submit to you it's gone. That sales cycle is made up of a sales rep doing hand to hand combat and trying to interpret the buying situation. And it doesn't need to be like that. Like my grandfather was a wonderful rep. He's been dead for a long time. I'm telling you, I could roll him up out of the grave right now, teach him some new technology, and he could be just as effective. Because not much has changed in that sales cycle. And it doesn't need to be that way. So what we do at Collective Eye, and I'm not here to give you a Collective Eye pitch, but I think you need to understand how we think about things because it influences the way we structure our sales organization, is we have built the world's first enterprise buyer network. So much like in B2C ad tech, for those of you guys and gals that work in B2C, there's lots of networks and data that you can leverage through lookalike modeling, target folks, see where they are in the funnel, you know, target them when they're ready to buy, look at intent, things like that. But how do you do that in B2B enterprise sales? There's no buyer network. So we spent the last five years building a buyer network. So when our clients work with us, they're taking a look at how these organizations bought in the past, who makes those buys. So think about it, if you've never sold to eBay before, you have no idea that a half a million dollar deal has to be reviewed by procurement. You don't know, you've never sold to them before. A senior manager can sign it, but procurement's gotta approve it. And if it's over a million bucks, they have to have three bids. So your sales rep might think, I sent over a contract, we're like 30 days from close. Right, stage, close one, or closing, or whatever your stage is. Right, the reality of it is, you're probably at 20, 30% closing that deal. You just don't know. So we build a buyer network, and we're focusing on how buyers buy versus focusing on sellers sell, right? We're not trying to change the craft or the art. We're actually trying to put some science into the art and science of selling. 
So that's what we're actually doing at Collective Eye. And it's important to understand that for me to talk to you a little bit about how we run our sales organization. Because here's your current paradigm, right? And this is kind of a tough one to follow. But what I'm trying to demonstrate here is, you know, whether you're company A, B, C, or D, you're closing 2% of everything you touch and you're losing 98%. And you sell the way you sell with Excel, reporting, lead scoring, dashboards. And how do you measure that? You're typically measuring that with calls and email and what your activity. But if you leverage a network, you, know, you probably still have the same activity going in because you haven't changed anything. But if you're leveraging a network about how other organizations sell to these buyers and how do these buyers buy, and you put predictive analytics on the back of that, then the type of things that you can actually execute and bring out of that is it might take buyer X, whoa, Oh man, this is a build. Mm. Builds. Well, it might take buyer X three months to get something done. This lawyer might be involved in this deal. Procurement has to reveal these things. These are the three people that need to sign off on deals at this stage. So when you, when you, when you profile the way companies buy, you can actually adjust the way you sell to them. And we didn't invent this. Like Amazon, this is just one example of what's going on in B2C marketing. Amazon does this in B2C all day long. I mean, how does a company build a billion dollar ad tech business in less than five years? Right, five years ago, Amazon, zero ad sales. This year, billion dollars. Throwing off a ton of margin, right? Most profitable thing they have in the organization. Throwing off a ton of margin. You know what that thing's funding? a ton of prime memberships, which is smart, right? Because that's probably the best loyalty program on the web. Best customers self-selecting in to pre-shop. But they leverage the network. So I wanted you to get that context to talk to you about how we do things. So I came on board two months ago to build a sales and services and marketing organization. So let me talk to you a little bit about the tools we use. So the first thing I had to do when build a sales organization, do I wanna focus on the athlete or do I wanna focus on the Rolodex? I focus on the athlete, right? I focus on the athlete. I'm not looking for, I got a buyer network. So I'm not even focused on somebody that's got a big LinkedIn profile. I focus on the athlete. Who can execute, right? Who can go craft that story, connect the dots, tell stories that matter. Focus on the problem, not the product. So I went to my good friends, Drew and Josh over at Upsider. Here's your plug. And I said, I need some athletes, right? I need some athletes. And those guys started going out and get me some athletes. And, and they'll tell you, right? My thing was I'm not looking for anyone specific. I'm looking for folks who are athletes, who've sold to sales and marketing people before. Right? I use a company called Altus for the front end of my stack. I don't have time to manage an SDR team. In fact, I'm not a huge fan. If you're doing enterprise sales, then this is just a this is me. Right? But I think it's difficult to I was a VP. At FedEx, I was a VP at eBay. I never took a meeting that was set up by an SDR. I took meetings that were set up by people I knew or people that referred to me. I didn't, I didn't take meetings from cold calls. It wasn't because I was being a bad guy. It just didn't, just didn't work out that way. Researchers are better for you, right? Lead development reps coming in with a high frame. If you're selling something more transactional, absolutely works well. But if you're selling at an enterprise level, it's, it, you want to do that. So I use this company called Altus, which I would encourage you to check out. Altus is interesting. It's a group of VPs of sales that basically are a private equity firm. And they go into early stage companies where you don't have a VP of sales, or maybe you have one who's focused on something, and they come in and they, they, they take a look at your organization and they'll do that work. They'll help you set it up. And then and, and, and they'll take warrants in your company or stock or you can pay them, depending on what you want to do. But they approach and say, where are we going to invest our time? So you'll get a VP of sales from IBM. You'll get a VP of sales from SAP. You'll get to be able to bring in collective assets from about 40 different companies. It's an interesting thing to check out. And if you're starting your company and you're running that, think about your sales organization, check it out. Those guys have developed really good front-end social marketing capabilities. So I use them. I use uh, Sales Navigator and we use Sales Loft on the front end. You know, We don't have a dialer, but we use Sales Loft for our, for our communications cadence. And clearly, you know, Sales Navigator. Salesforce.com is our CRM. It's a wonderful container. It never tells me anything that I didn't tell it, but it's a wonderful place to store information. <laughs> I use my own tool for the sales process. It'd be pretty moronic if I didn't, right? If I, like, oh, you got a buyer network. What are you using, huh? I'm using that. And then on the back end, I use Tatango for client success. 
All right, so try to stitch it all together there. So those are the tools that we use over at Collective Eye. The sales team we've been able to stand up in two months looks a little bit like this. So I have six directors of enterprise client development. Now use the title client development versus sales because we're developing clients, right? I mean, we're developing, it's a SaaS-based revenue model. Like we're, we're developing clients. Um, they focus on sales organizations that have 200 or more people in the sales organization. And then I have, almost done. And then I have four client development managers that focus on 50 to 199. And certainly they can drop down below that. I have four researchers that are aligned with regions, a team with Altus to drive lead gen and social selling. I got two FTEs that focus on events. And then I have one that focuses on thought leadership. Like how do, how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you engage your prospects? How do you engage your customers with thought leadership pieces? And it's always good to have somebody generating that and, and researching that and not having your folks spend their time on it. And then some of the work we do, some of the tactics is look, we celebrate a sales culture. It's the oxygen for all of our organizations. We celebrate that and we hold each other accountable. I don't do sales meetings or training during sales hours. Why am I taking my sales folks away from money making time so that I can bring them in during sales hours? So we do our training in the evening and I split it up. So we'll, we'll do it on Tuesday nights and we'll, we'll all get together around seven o'clock and get some beer and get some pizza and, and, and bond on that. And then the West Coast guys, they gotta suck it up a little bit because it's four o'clock for them, but then they had to suck it up this morning. So this morning, you know, we, we were at it at 8.30. So that's 5.30 for them and that sucks for them, but you know, you mix it up. You got, you know, you got to do that. So, but I don't, I don't take my guys and gals off the street during selling time for non-revenue producing, non-productive stuff. They don't like it, and I don't like it. All right? Then you get upset about it. So we don't do it. Uh, we also connect twice a week to build our personal networks. I set aside specific time as an executive in a company. You have a network of three thousand people. You got to leverage it, right? And, and your folks don't know how to do it. So you set aside specific time to say, bring me five things you're looking to kick down the door on. We'll work on that specifically for an hour and we'll get those emails out so that you're not reaching out cold. Um, we expect our salespeople to be the highest paid people in the company. Uh, and we don't begrudge them that. Like nobody stands around and gets upset about that. Like we set the comp plans up to be, we want that to happen. I don't do forecast Fridays. I never start a conversation with, hey, Max, tell me what's going on with Magento. I know what's going on with Magento. Like, I don't ask, right? We don't focus on that. We don't focus on what's going on with. I think that is one of the most, I hate that. I hated it as a rep. I hate it as a manager. And I just think it's a waste of time because I know that conversation is going to be directed. It's a one, I mean, what other organization is a bottoms up reporting structure? Like a pipeline meeting. You know, tell me what's going on. And I'm going to listen to what you want to talk to me about, which are the things that are interesting for you. Like I should be a little bit more proactive and, and, and drive that conversation. So we don't do it. And uh, the other thing is we make it a habit of saying that's a good idea and versus saying that's a good idea, but, and that's a big difference, right? If you're trying to build a collaborative culture where people participate in that success, it's a good idea. And is a whole lot better than it's a good idea, but, so counts what's countable, measure what's measurable, and what's not measurable, make it measurable. So that's what we do. So I hope that was helpful. Um, thanks, uh, thanks for uh, letting me talk to you, and I'll be around if you have any questions.